Okay, well, please welcome with me Professor Peter Gray. Thank you. What a, an honor it is to be here. Um, I'm not sure if this was Walter's idea. I kind of assume it was to call this the Brian Sutton Smith Memorial Lecture. If it was, I'm sure that the purpose was to make me humble. Um, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night last night about 1.30 with this thought. What if the spirit of uh, Brian Sutton, the, maybe the ghost of Sutton Smith, was standing right behind me, kind of making facial expressions <laughs> about what I was talking about. I'm sure he wouldn't agree with a lot of it. He'd kind of say, hey, you know, you, you're trying to take this wild animal of play and you're trying to pin it down. You're trying to define it, you know. <laughs> he, he was famous for the ambiguity of play and I'm trying to disambiguate it, right? So, but, um, so I, I think in, in, now that I've refuted my lecture, or Brian Smith has refuted my lecture, <laughs> uh, Sutton Smith, uh, let, me, let me proceed. Let, just out of curiosity, how, how many of you actually ever met Brian Sutton Smith? See, I never have, so I hope some of you will tell me what he was actually really like. I've read his books and I'm kind of in awe of his writing, but I never had the opportunity to know him as a person. Are you hearing me okay? Does this need to be closer to me? It's okay, all right. Now there's a handout for this talk. Did, does every, is there anybody who does not have that handout? If you raise your hand, somebody will come around and give it to you. There's a few over on the edges there and a few in back. The handout is useful to have because I'm covering a lot of material and I will sort of be referring to it as I go along. And also that way you don't have to make any notes and you can have your prepared for the test without, um, <laughs> without having to do, it, to do a lot of writing as we go along. So um, just so you know where I am coming from, I'm uh, an evolutionary psychologist, which means that really that I'm interested in human nature uh, I'm interested in how our human nature came about by natural selection. I'm especially interested in the nature of human children, and most especially now for many years, in those aspects of children's nature that came about by natural selection to serve the function of their education. The aspects of children's nature that we cut off in school, their curiosity, their playfulness, their willfulness, their sociability. These are the characteristics that, that exist in other mammals too, but they've been honed and heightened in the human being because we are the educative animal. These are the instincts that lead children to educate themselves when they have the opportunity to do so. So my focus today is going to be on play, although I don't want to neglect exploration that comes from curiosity, the sociability that's part of exploration where children are exploring one another's minds, listening to what other people have to say and sharing what they know with other people, which can occur in the context of play but also in the context of less playful kinds of activities. Sadly, um, in the, over the, really over the course of my uh, adult lifetime, um, over the last 50, 60 years, we have been gradually taking play away from children, such that it's almost gone from children's lives. Real play is almost gone from children's lives. At one time, it was the bulk of children's lives. And throughout most of human history, play was the bulk of children's human lives. One way I've studied play is to interview anthropologists who have lived in hunter-gatherer cultures, and they say that the children from age four on through their teenage years are playing and exploring largely on their own, largely away from adults from dawn to dusk. And that's how they learn. That's how they learn all the skills, all the attitudes and so on that they need to be competent in the society. Play came about in the course of natural selection to serve the function of education and children need lots of play 
in order to educate themselves. We are providing them with only a tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of play that children throughout history have normally had, except for times of slavery and child slavery and times of uh, intense child labor. Uh, if you subtract those times out, we are living at a time and place now where children are more deprived of freedom, more deprived of play than they ever have been in the history of humanity. That's the problem that we really need to solve for the sake of our children, for the sake of the future of humanity. So I'm talking about play today, and as I said, I'm going to define play. Uh, and play is not easily defined, and it's certainly not defined in terms of one characteristic. Um, the definition I've come up with comes from sort of culling the research and writing of quite a number of different play scholars and combining that with some of my own observations. But um, it, it, you, you have the handout, and I'm going to go kind of, you can sort of follow along in the handout, and I will refer to it from time to time as I go through here. So play is a concept that fills our minds with contradictions the more we try to think about it. There are many paradoxes to play. Play is serious, and yet it's not serious. Play is imaginative and spontaneous, yet I'm going to argue that play always involves rules, and it's how children learn to abide by rules and create rules. Play is not real, but it takes place in the real world, and it's how children learn to cope with the real world. Play is childish, and yet it underlies the greatest achievements of adults. From a biological perspective, which is my perspective, we could say that play is the means by which nature has assured that young mammals will practice all the kinds of skills that they need to practice in order to grow up into viable, effective, thriving adults. From a religious perspective, we might say that play is God's gift, which makes life on Earth worthwhile. And that's the gift that we have been taking away from children. I'll be in my workshop this afternoon, I'll talk more about how we've been taking it away from children and what the consequences of that, that, of that have been for children's mental health. The um, children everywhere, wherever they've been observed, wherever they have ample time and freedom and space and opportunity to play, play in certain universal ways. Uh, anthropologists have observed these kinds of play everywhere that I've listed on the handout under B here. Physical or locomotor play, by the way, these are not necessarily truly separate categories. Any given instance of play may include all of these. These are kind of the functional ways of thinking about play. So there's, there's imaginative, there, I'm sorry, there is uh, physical locomotor play, the playful running, leaping, fighting, chasing, climbing trees, all the kinds of things that children do outdoors. That they, they, This is how children and other young mammals build their bodies burn off calories, build their hearts and lungs. It's also how they develop courage. They play in dangerous ways when they do this, and that way they become courageous. They learn how to deal with danger. They, t they dose themselves with a certain amount of danger as they climb trees or leap over cliffs or do all the other things. Yeah, other, other mammals have been observed to do the same thing. There is, so that's the kind of play that we most obviously share with other animals. We've all got physical bodies, and this is how young mammals develop their physical bodies. Our children are not designed by nature to run around tracks or lift weights or swim back and forth in swimming pools. That's boring, even for me. Our children are designed to chase one another around, screaming and laughing until their sides are splitting, and that's how they get physically fit. And they're not going to be physically fit when we deprive them of that opportunity. The other kinds of play that come next on this list are more or less uniquely human. And they have to do with the kinds of things that human beings have to learn everywhere. We are the linguistic animal. 
Nobody teaches children their native language. Children all learn their native language themselves and they learn it playfully. The very first, for those of you who've had babies or observed babies, you know the very first cooing and babbling is always playful. It's always when the child is in a playful mood. The child is playing with these sounds. The first words are never used to ask for anything. They're not used instrumentally. They're used playfully. The child is playing with language. And as children grow older, they play in more complex ways with language. They become little poets. They use rhymes and alliteration and riddles. Uh, there's research showing that children, as they get a little bit older and they're interacting socially in play, that the language they use in play with one another is far more complex than the language you ever hear them use in the classroom or that you ever hear when you as an adult are talking with a child because when children are talking with one another it's real they've got to work it out they're using language and they're practicing language this is how language develops in play we are the animal with opposable thumbs. We're the animal that builds our environment. We have always built tools. We have built means of conveyance. We have built huts or whatever to live in and so on and so forth. And so not surprising, our, our children come into the world biologically designed to want to engage in constructive play, building things. What they build depends upon the culture that they're growing up in. But when children are free, children everywhere play at building things. We are the animal and perhaps the only animal that really is capable of imagination. And all of our higher order thought involves imagination. What we call hypothetical thinking always involves imagination. We're thinking of something that actually isn't concretely right there in front of us. We seem to be the only animal that's capable of doing that. All of play involves imagination, some play more so than others. And so what are children practicing in imaginative play? They're practicing this higher order thinking, the ability to think about things that aren't actually physically present and to think logically about them. If there's a troll under the bridge, what does that mean? What do we have to do if there's a troll under the bridge? They're being scientists in that kind of sense. So, so, imaginative, so imaginative play is how children develop the capacity for higher order human thought. Um, games with formal rules. Every culture has games with formal rules. In our culture, these games tend to be competitive games. And we think of the rules as sort of making the competition even. So uh, games like chess or checkers or, or uh, hopscotch or... Um, you know, these are all games with formal rules that may or may not be written down, but which are passed along from generation to generation. Not all cultures have competitive games. Hunter-gatherer cultures, according to the anthropologists I've interviewed, don't play competitively. Uh, they play in cooperative ways, but still they have games with rules. They're sort of more like dance-like games or cooperative games. You have to keep the ball in the air and so on. Uh, but there, rule, there are clear rules about what you can do or not you. Well, we are the animal that has to follow rules in every culture, no matter where we grow up. And throughout our time as, as Homo sapiens, we have always had to follow rules. That's part of being a human being. So isn't it interesting that all of these ways, all these things that human beings have to learn, no matter where they're growing up, these are the things that children naturally play at. They are born to learn the things that they need to learn to be effective human, adult human beings, and they, and, and they learn them through play. And of course, the kind of play that children most desire, and which cuts across all of these other kinds, is social play. The most important thing for kids is to play with other kids. And well, that should be, because the most important that any hum, thing that any human being has to learn is how to get along with other people, how to get along with peers. You can live a reasonably happy life without knowing much else. But you can't live a reasonably happy life if you don't know how to get along with other people. You can't have a good marriage. You can't have good work partners. You can't have real friends if you don't know how to get along with other people. So it's no surprise that the biggest play drive of children is to play with other children and to play with other children away from adults because in their bones, in their, in their DNA, they know that they have to learn to negotiate with peers without an adult authority, without some authority figure solving their problems for them. 
And so these are the ways that children naturally play. And I think just by thinking of this, it becomes so obvious how important play is. It becomes such a no-brainer that we need to allow children much more time for play than we have currently been allowing it. So those are universal varieties of play, but I still haven't defined play. So I, what I've done is on the handout, I've written, I've, I've identified five defining characteristics of play. And so I should begin by saying that play is not necessarily all or none. There, an activity can be more or less playful depending upon the degree to which these characteristics are present. Um, when we talk about adults, I'm much more likely to use the word playful than the, the word play, because really full-blown play characterizes children throughout the world, not just in our culture, much more than it characterizes adults. So um, the first characteristic of play that I've listed, and the most important one, is that it is self-chosen and self-directed. If somebody else is telling you to do it, if somebody else is either making you do it or making it kind of difficult for you not to do it, it would be embarrassing not to do it, it's not play. So if a teacher stands up in the classroom and says, okay, now children, we're all going to play this, you right off know that's not play. Play is freely chosen by the children. Play is created by the children. It's not something that's imposed upon children by adults. And, I'm going, and, and, there, and the reason for that, the reason I don't want to call it play is because one of the cri major criteria, major things that children learn in play is how to create their own activities, how to take initiative, how to come up with their own ideas and make those ideas work. And when we have adults doing that, even if it's still fun for the children, I don't want to deny that this couldn't be fun. I don't want to deny that this might not be a good way to teach certain lessons, do it playfully, but let's not call that play with, because it's not self-chosen. by. It's a perversion of play in a certain sense. So play is self-chosen and it is self-directed. So players, the players create the rules or if they or they all agree to buy into the rules. Now what's interesting here is play is self-chosen and self-directed and it's also usually social. Throughout most of the world, throughout most of time, play has been social with other kids. So what does that mean? I choose, I, I choose how I want to play, but I'm playing with you and you want to play in some different way. <laughs> Well, now we've got to put our heads together. We've got to negotiate. We've got to figure this out. We've got to come up with something that we both want to do. And we've got to come up with some way of playing that we both want to play. And so what are children learning every time they play socially? What are they practicing? They're practicing negotiation. They're practicing getting, how do I get my needs met? While also being sure that you get your needs met. And this, this this understanding that I have to allow you to get your needs met, this doesn't come from any kind of highfalutin moral philosophy. This is just absolutely necessity because if I fail to pay attention to you, if I fail to, to allow you to meet your needs in this context of play, you'll quit. The most important freedom in play is freedom to quit. Just as you're always free to, to start play, you're also always free to quit. And so if I'm a bit of a bully and I want you to play just the way I want you to play, at some point you're going to remember that your mom is calling you and that you've got to go home for supper, right? And if that happens enough times, I'm going to learn, okay, well, next time I better pay a little more attention to. So this is how children overcome narcissism. This is how children learn not to be bullies. Um, not everybody learns it perfectly. I don't want to idealize children, nor do I want to idealize the lessons that are learned in play. But this is probably the most important kind of lessons that children are learning in play, is how to, how to create activities collaboratively with other people that those other people appreciate and enjoy as much as you do an absolutely essential skill in order to live a happy human life. 
So um, I want you to think about, we're still on number one here on this list, the difference between an old-fashioned pickup game, I'll say baseball because that's what I played forever as a kid, an old-fashioned baseball game that you, uh, and, and, a more, and a little league game, okay? What's the difference between the two? The old-fashioned pickup game is play, the little league game is not play. What is the difference in what they're learning? In the old-fashioned pickup game, you go out to the vacant lot. There's no manicured field there. You have to create the field. You have to figure it out. There's no, there's no, there's not 18 players and somebody divide them into teams. There's a, there's a bunch of kids. Some big ones, some little ones, some good players, some not so good players. Few of them have gloves. You know, somebody's brought a bat, somebody's brought a ball. It may not be a real baseball. Uh, there's windows. If you hit it over here, you'll break windows. There's a street over here, and if you run out into the street. So there's a lot of negotiation that goes on. You've got to choose up sides. You've got to figure out what the ground rules here. It's an automatic out if you hit it towards the windows. Big Billy here who can slam the ball. I mean, to make it fair, he's got a bat with his left hand with a broomstick. You create, you create the rules. And it's a creative process, and it's a process designed in such a way that it will be fun for everybody. Billy would have no problem just slamming the ball. It wouldn't even be fun for him. But to do it left-handed with a broomstick, that's kind of fun. So in this game, which you could never do that in the Little League game, the coach would never allow Billy to bat with a broomstick with his left hand. But in this game, you can do that. You can catch behind your back if you want. You can do all these things to challenge yourself in the context of play, because in this game, even though your team cheers wildly every time you score a point, nobody really cares who wins. Nobody remembers who wins the next day. The whole point is to have fun and to challenge your own abilities and to make sure that everybody else is having fun, including the players on the other team, because if uh, they're not having fun, they'll quit. And you need them to stay, otherwise the game won't continue. So that's, so when we we, we might think we're doing children a favor when we set up their games for them. They don't have to set it up. They've got this wonderful manicured field. They, they've got bats and balls and, 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 and uh, uniforms and all of that stuff. We might think we're doing, but we are not doing them a favor. We are taking away the value of play when we put them in adult-directed sports instead of just sending them out to make up their own games. Second characteristic of play is that it is motivated by means more than ends. In other words, it's intrinsically motivated. So when you are doing things that are not play, you are doing them to achieve some goal. You're scratching an itch to get rid of the itch, running away from a tiger to get away from a tiger, reading a boring book to get a good grade on a test, or uh, working at some dreary job in order to get a paycheck. And when you're doing things with that attitude, you take the shortest, most direct route that you can to get the goal that you want. Because it's all about getting the goal. It's getting that thing. Play turns that around. Play is not about the goal. It's not about winning that game. It's about the process of doing it. It's about the process of doing it. it is, you're doing it for its own sake. You know how um, graduation speakers almost invariably at uh, high school and college graduations say, follow your passions. That's their advice to the new graduates. It's almost cruel because how, <laughs> what on earth is a passion? <laughs> you know, where would they have had the opportunity to develop passionate interests if all they've been doing is school, right? Where do you discover passions? Where do you pursue passions? Play, of course, that's almost by definition, play is pursuing passions. Playing the different things and exploring different ways of playing is how children discover what they love to do. Play is doing what you love to do. And if you really could pursue your passions, as I'm sure many people in this room have, you would say you're still playing in life. You, you discovered what you love to do and play as a child and now you're still doing it. As, a, as your career. You're, you're doing what those graduation speakers said that you should do. But that's very hard for children to do, for young people to do today, because they don't have the time for hobbies and for, 
finding their own interests and pursuing their own interests. They're spending all their time doing stuff that adults are telling them to do, for which they're being graded and judged and so on, for which it's all about the goal, the reward, and not at all about, is this just really fun? So um, play is intrinsically motivated. Now, to the degree that, um, So let me, just, let me just give a couple of examples. That, that when I say the play is intrinsically motivated, I don't mean that it necessarily doesn't have goals. There may be goals, but the goals are only valuable as part of the play itself. They're not independently valuable. So children building a sandcastle on the beach, they have the goal of building a beautiful sandcastle, but it's the building of the sandcastle not the having of the sandcastle that is the reward. They know the sandcastle is going to be washed into the sea when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the surf comes up. They know if an adult were to come along and say, oh, you can stop all this work now, there's all this effort, I'll build the sandcastle for you, they would not be happy about that. So it's the building of the sandcastle, not the having of it. In that pickup baseball game, they have the goal of scoring points, maybe even the goal of winning. But that is secondary to playing the game. Then if somebody were to if somebody were to prize the goal of winning more than following the rules and playing the game, then it would not be play anymore. Now it turns out that rewards can undermine play. You know, we adults like to give rewards to children. We give them trophies and A's and gold stars and praise and all of this thinking that we're doing them a favor and that we are likely improving their love of whatever it is that they're giving, we're giving them a reward for. But there's actually a certain amount of research that says that what we're doing when we do that is we're undermining their pleasure in this activity. There are many, many experiments that show this. What probably the most well-known, some of you, many of you have probably heard of this study, was done quite a number of years ago with kindergarten children by, um, um, by Lepper and Green, uh, Mark Lepper and David Green. And what they did was they observed in these kindergarten classrooms children who were playing freely, and they found that essentially all of the children in these classrooms enjoyed playing with magic markers, these felt tip pens. So that was something that they basically all liked to do. They did this on their own free time. They weren't being rewarded for it. They just liked to do it. But then they did this little experiment where half of the children were rewarded just once for playing with magic markers. And the way they did this is they said, well, we're going to have a visitor come into the classroom. And, if you, and it would be really nice if you drew a picture with magic markers for our visitor. And if you do, you'll get this beautiful good player certificate. It was a very beautiful certificate, and all the children wanted it. And they all drew a picture for the person coming in. Now, the, in the other condition, the control condition, there was somebody coming in, and the, 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 they, the, they asked the children, would you draw a picture? It would be nice if you drew a picture. But nothing was said about a reward, and no reward was given. Then they followed up, and, they, and there were two consequences of this manipulation. The first consequence, which was the one that they predicted, and the one that we most often read about, was that those children who had been rewarded with this good player certificate subsequently played with magic markers less than they had before. <laughs> Whereas those who had drawn the picture for somebody coming in continued that and weren't rewarded, they continued to play at the high level. Explanation, even being rewarded once turns your attitude about playing with magic markers from play to work. <laughs> this is something you do for a reward. <laughs> If there's no reward anymore, why would I continue to do it? You know, we reward kids for everything in school, and then we wonder why they're not interested later on in what we reward. We reward them for reading, we reward them for working with numbers, and so on and so forth. We are essentially training them that all of this stuff that could be play and fun is work. And, and work, of course, is something that you should avoid whenever possible. You do it if you need to in order to get a reward or avoid a punishment, but it's not something you do just for fun. The other observation that they made, which was not predicted, is that they had these uh, pictures uh, analyzed for how great the picture was, how, how well done, how creative it was. 
And interestingly, those children who had drawn the picture for reward drew worse pictures <laughs> than those pictures who, those who had not drawn it for reward. That's the other thing about rewards. You do the minimum you have to do to get the reward. You know, that, the students in school, if, 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 I, if I need to get an A, I kind of figure out what's the minimum I have to learn to get the damn A. I'd be wasting my time if I learned more than that, right? <laughs> so that's the non-play attitude towards what you're doing. That's the work attitude towards what you're doing. The play attitude is I'm doing this because I'm interested in it. That rare playful student doesn't give a damn about the grade on the test. What she cares about is, is understanding this stuff and enjoying it and de delving into it and so forth. But that's not, that's not what we reinforce in our, in our school system. So the third characteristic of play that I've listed here is that play is guided by mental rules. So um, this seems kind of um, um, surprising to many people who think of play as free and spontaneous and not rules. But if you think about it, all sorts of play involve rules. And in fact, in many cases, the distinction between play and some other activity that in some ways resembles that playful activity is that the one has rules and the other doesn't. So even think of what looks like maybe the most wild kind of play, a couple of boys chasing one another around, throwing one another, play fighting, and, and so on. It looks absolutely wild. You don't look at that and, and immediately think what they're doing is they're abiding by rules. But think of all the rules. No biting, no kicking, no punching hard. If you're the bigger of the two, you have to self-handicap. If you throw somebody, you throw them on a pillow. The difference between a play fight and a real fight is the play fight has rules, but the real fight doesn't. The play fight is, as much as anything else, an exercise in restraint. It's an exercise in how can I engage in this vigorous activity while controlling myself in such a way that I don't actually hurt this other person. Because if I were to hurt this other person, that would end it. So, and we're just having fun. So we're engaging in this vigorous activity without hurting one another. So that's the, so, so even that has rules. Think about, think about the child building or a group of children building a sandcastle. The rule there is you're in constructive play, you're working with a certain medium, you have some kind of an image in your mind about what you're doing, and the rule is you're, you are creating that in, in, in the concrete reality in front of you, recreating that image that you have in mind. You're not just randomly piling up sand. No, you wouldn't call that play. You're not just randling, randomly stacking up uh, blocks. You're doing something ordered. Play always has this characteristic. Play is by always intellectual in a certain sense because you are thinking about what you're doing. You have some s mental set about what you're doing and then you're carrying it out. So play is how children learn to think about what they're doing and then to actually do it in reality. It's an extraordinarily important and basic skill. Um, in, in, um, in formal games with rules, of course, there the imagination seems it's less produced, but yet even imagine a game of chess. So you've got a couple of people engaged in a game of chess, and the rules are already present. They're not making up the rules, but they're buying into this imaginary world. You're saying, we are entering this imaginary world. This is a world where bishops can only move on the diagonal. In the real world, bishops can go wherever they want. But now we are in an imaginary world where bishops can only move on the diagonal. And all the other characteristics of this imaginary world, and we're now thinking, all of our thinking is within this imaginary world. So you are practicing this aspect of imagination. If this is so, and if my goal is this, then what are the logical things that I can, that I can do? So, um, the, um, let me talk a little bit about imagination and what children, why it's so important for children to practice imagination. Really, all of the things, as I said before, all of the 
the, the accomplishments of, of adults that we think of as really contributing, maybe not all of them, but a huge number of them that we really think of as contributing to the culture involve imagination. You know, think of, for example, an architect who's designing uh, a building. And it's going to be a real building, but first it's an imaginary building in her mind. She's imagining what this building might look at. She's imagining the flow of people through this building, and she's picturing it. Just as children are imagining and picturing the, the troll under the bridge or the witch behind the tree or whatever it is that they are imagining, she's, she's imagining that, and then she's imagining the consequences. And then that, that purely imaginary um, house might become a playhouse as she builds it with cardboard or in some way a kind of a model of the house before it becomes a real house. Or think of a scientist. Scientists don't just collect data. They imagine about the data. They, they try to make sense of the data. And as soon as they try to make sense of the data, they're dealing with imagination because they're now dealing not with something that's concrete, they're dealing with, a, with a, an idea, like gravity is a, just an idea. Nobody's ever seen gravity. It's an idea that explains a lot of things. Every theory, every hypothesis in science involves some imagined construct that seems to explain the observed phenomena. All great scientists think of themselves as playing mentally. Einstein you know, famously claim that his, all of his, his accomplishments in theoretical, uh, phys theoretical physics and mathematics were what he called combinatorial play. He, he famously said that part of what allowed him to think of, the, of his idea of relativity was to imagine himself chasing a sunbeam and what would happen if he caught up with it. What a childlike see, imagine, imagine scene. And it's often said that geniuses are those people who somehow retain the child's capacity for imagination and combine it with all of the expertise that they acquire as they pursue their chosen field. Geniuses generally seem to be those people who retain that childlike capacity for imagination and play throughout their lives. But in all of us, no matter what we're doing, Every day we're making use of it. Just to even think about tomorrow involves imagination. So imaginative play is so important for children. It's what they're practicing all the time when they're playing. Fifth characteristic of play that I've listed here, which really follows logically from the others, is that play is conducted in an alert, active but non-stressed frame of mind. What I should really say is not overly stressed frame of mind. You can be somewhat stressed in play. That little girl playfully climbing the tree may climb the tree to a point where she feels a little bit of stress, a little bit of fear. But before it turns into panic, she comes down. So play is, play is necessarily involved. You can't be passive in play because Play, you have to attend, you're always attending to the rules. You've got something in mind. Play, by definition, is the, is the pursuit of, of fulfilling some mental concept that you have about what you are doing. So you can't be passive in play. Your mind is necessarily active. But your mind is not overly stressed for all the reasons that I've just been talking about. Nobody's evaluating you. It doesn't matter in any real sense. Nobody's going to give you a failing grade, or nobody's going to give you a passing grade if you do it well. The removal of evaluation is crucial to it. Nobody, it, it, and it does because it takes place in a fantasy world, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're completely free to fail. That doesn't mean you're not trying as hard as you can. But one of the reasons you're trying this at all, doing this thing that's hard for you, is because you're free to fail because you don't have to be good at it. When you're doing stuff in a situation where you're being judged, the typical situation in school, you want to damn well be good at that and only do the things you're good at. You don't want to sh try to do things that you're not good at in that situation. But in play, you can do things that you're not good at, and, and that's what children, children are doing that all the time as they, um, as, as they play. So. Um, Play, one, 
one way, one term that uh, um, is often used to describe this mental state of being very engrossed in what you're doing, very alert and active and attentive to what you're doing, but not stressed about it, not overly stressed about it, is the concept of flow. And when Csikszentmihalyi uh, initially began to work on flow, his initial paper on flow was about play. It was the state of mind of play. Unfortunately, all of his subsequent writing, he deleted the word play from it, and I've often wondered why. But generally speaking, that state of mind that what that Michele calls play is uh, called flow is the state of mind of play. It's the playful state of mind. And there's a great deal of research that shows that that state of mind is the best state of mind for learning new things, for any activity that's creative, uh, for anything that's out of the routine of what you already do. When you are in, there's a whole theory of, uh, called the broaden and build theory about emotions. And I, I would modify the theory a little bit, but the theory is kind of this. When you are in a, a, a happy state of mind, but I would say a playful state of mind, that's the state of mind for doing new things. That's the state of mind for trying out things that you don't already know how to do well. When you are in a stress state of mind, that's the state of mind for, doing, for relying on the tried and true that you already know how to do. So when a real tiger is chasing you, that's not the time to try out new ways of getting away from a tiger. But when your playmate pretending to be a tiger is chasing you, that's the time to experiment with new ways of getting away from a tiger. So the, 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 the stress state of mind puts us in a kind of a mode of doing what, what's already well ingrained into our nervous system, doing the kinds of things that are either instinctive or have become instinctive because we've done them so many times. We become better at doing those things when we're stressed. We become even better at doing the things we can already do well when we're stressed. There's a lot of research on that. When people are evaluating us, we become better at doing the things we're already good at, but we become worse at doing the things that we're not good at. So the state of flow is good for doing new kinds of things. It, there are many experiments. Let me just give you one example of an experiment. There's a researcher, used to be at uh, Cornell, uh, Alice Eisen, who did a, quite a number of experiments along this line. One of them was this. She, she, would, um, she had students, college students from Cornell, come into the laboratory and solve a certain insight problem. And the problem that she used in this particular experiment was the candle problem, a classic problem that works like this. You're given a small candle and a box of tacks and a, book of, a box of matches and, um, you are, and there's a bulletin board in the room. And your job is to mount the candle on the bulletin board so it's upright and you can light it and it will burn. Now, it, the solution, which seems obvious once you know it, is that you dump the tacks out of the tack box. You tack that box onto the bulletin board so it's a shelf, and then you melt a little wax on the shelf and mount the candle, on this small candle on the shelf, and light it. Now, in the typical way of doing this experiment, where you just invite students in, and, and, and even at Cornell, where they're bright students, in fact, it doesn't make any difference where you do this, you get about the same results. About 15% of college students solve this problem. About 85% can't solve the problem in whatever the time limit is that they have to do it. So Eisen did this interesting little experiment where she had some of the students, before they went in to solve the problem, they spent, I think it was five minutes watching a slapstick comedy. And the control condition, they watched some kind of a travel log or something else, and there were a couple of other control conditions. What she found is, after watching the slapstick comedy, 85%, no, 75% solved the problem. In the other conditions, it was the typical 15%. Imagine that, just watching five minutes of a slapstick comedy, you, you quadruple the number of people who solve this problem correctly. 
She later did this experiment, a similar experiment with actual physicians. She went into their offices uh, and she gave them a, a case history that had kind of a snag in the case history. It had some misleading information. And, um, but it was a case history that if you, could, if you could think about it clearly and kind of originally, you could, think, you could figure out what the source of this disease was. And she had two conditions. In one condition, she gave the physician a little piece of candy <laughs> beforehand. And so this was to put the physician in a good mood. In her, she thinks of it as good mood. I think of it, I mean, I think maybe giving the physician $1,000 would put them in a good mood. <laughs> but giving the physician a piece of candy, I think that kind of puts them maybe in a good mood, but even more like in a playful mood. Like this is, we're being kids here, right? I mean, this is candy, this is what children do. So, we're being kids. And uh, what she found was that the physicians reliably solved that problem better if you gave them a piece of candy first. So next time you go to your doctor, <laughs> be sure that you put your doctor in a playful mood before your doctor. I'm not sure about, uh, about doing surgery. I might want my physician to be. <laughs> yeah. So at, at any rate, there's a lot of experiments along that line. That being in a playful mood makes you better, makes you more creative, any kind of problem solving that involves insight and thinking more creatively rather than allowing your mind to run along the usual tracks um, is, is uh, benefited by, by being in a playful mood. <clears throat> so um, we're now kind of on D here. The power of play lies in its triviality. You know, people often think of play as trivial, and it is. It is trivial in a certain sense. It doesn't get you anything in any immediate sense. You're not getting food. You're not, getting, you're not building your resume. You're not doing it to lose weight. You're not doing it for anything serious. You're just doing it because you want to do it. But the real interesting paradox of play is that the power of play lies in its triviality. It's the very fact that it's not serious. That's the very fact that it doesn't count for anything that makes it such a powerful vehicle for learning because you can do it without worrying about failure. You're free to fail. The play world is this safe simulation world. It's the place to try out things that would be too scary to try out in the real world, but you're free to try it out in the play world precisely because it doesn't count. And precisely the reason it doesn't count is there's no adults there judging you about it. There's no, there's no rewards. There's nobody going to be let down by not getting a trophy. Or no teammate's going to be let down if you, don't, if you don't succeed. So you're absolutely free to try. So play is trivial, but it's never easy. And the reason why play isn't easy is because once it becomes easy, it becomes boring, and it's no longer play. So children are constantly upping the level of their play, no matter what they're playing at. So toddlers who are playfully walking back and forth between two chairs as they're learning to walk, and they do it over and over and over again. Once they are good at walking, once they can do that easily, now that's no longer any fun. They don't do that anymore. Now they go move on to some higher level of locomotor play, maybe climbing onto the chair or climbing stairs or skipping or running or something else. Um, teenagers playing video games don't stick at the same level of the video game. One of the great attractive things about video games is there's no end to how complex you could go to higher and higher and higher levels. You've met this level and now you go to the next level. You're constantly at the cutting edge of your mental and physical capacity within the game that you're doing. Einstein didn't continue doing the same problems over and over again. That would have been very boring for him. It was play only because he would move on to new and different and therefore more challenging problems as he went along. So children, when allowed to play, are always at what we can think of as the cutting edge of their physical and intellectual capacity. So I want to, um, let me just see what, I should check the time here. All right, I want to kind of, as a way of review, um, just run through, we, we're now on uh, E on the handout, review of the developmental value of play. 
I just want to run through this thinking about sort of every realm of human development. Play and physical development. It's so obvious it's hardly even worth talking about, but I already did talk about the, the value of play and developing the physical body. Strong bodies, strong hearts, graceful movements, this is developed in play. Play and cognitive development. Think of all the ways that children are developing their minds. Planning, problem solving, uh, se uh, seeing in accordance with, uh, behaving in accordance with the mental concepts, uh, creativity, imagination, all aspects of what we think of as mental abilities are being developed in play. Play and social moral development. Play is how children learn to make friends. It's how they learn to get along with other people. It's how they overcome narcissism. Play is the, sort of the golden rule of play is a rule that's more complicated and difficult than the golden rule of the Bible. The golden rule that I learned in Sunday school is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the golden rule of play is to do unto others as they would have you do unto them, which is more difficult. Because in order to do that, in order to really play with you, I can't just assume that you want me to do what I want you to do to me, right? <laughs> I have to figure out what you want. <laughs> and that's a much more cognitively difficult thing. But to get along with other people, you've got to be able to do that. You've got to, in some sense, get into their minds and know what it is that they want. And then you have to satisfy that, at least to some degree, or they're not going to continue being playmates with you. So children are learning these amazing, subtle abilities in their play. They have to, even little children, watch little, watch three and four year olds play and the subtlety of their way of dealing with one another and pleasing one another and figuring out what it is that they need to do to keep the other person happy so that the other person doesn't quit is really quite remarkable. Play and emotional development. Um, I've talked a little bit about this, but you know, researchers studying play in other mammals um, quite some years ago came up with what they call the emotion regulation theory of play, which is that at least one major function of play is to help young animals learn to regulate their negative emotions, their emotions of fear and their emotion of anger. So all, all mammals, at least all mammals that have been studied for play, play in risky ways. They go, you can see goat kids running along cliffs. You can see monkeys swinging from branch to branch, chasing one another high enough up where they're swinging far enough uh, that if they fell, they could hurt themselves, probably not kill themselves, but hurt themselves. People have reported chimpanzees, young chimpanzees climbing to the top of a tree and then dropping and then catching themselves just before they hit the ground, all these things which would make moms very frightened. So these are, these, these are ways that animals play, and why do they play that way? Why didn't natural selection at least eliminate that kind of play? Sometimes an animal dies as a result of it. Not too, it's not too infrequent that they get hurt and injured at least for some period of time as a result of it. And the argument is there must therefore be some compensating benefit for that. And what is that compensating benefit? And the benefit that they've come up with, which makes perfect sense, is that all of us, no matter what kind of a mammal we are, are going to face real emergencies as we go through life. And if we haven't experienced, if we haven't practiced experiencing fear and, it, and learning how to control both our mind and our body during fearful conditions, then we might just panic in a real emergency. And if we panic in a real emergency, we might lose our life or our child, we might not be able to save our child's life. So it's extremely important to develop the kind of courage that children are developing when they play in these risky ways. The other thing that happens, and it seems to happen with animals too, is other animals besides us, is that um, the youngsters get mad at one another in play. <laughs> you know, sometimes, Sometimes you're play fighting and the, your playmate hit you too hard, you know, you, you didn't follow the rule, you get mad at him. <laughs> and so how do you resolve this anger? If you have an actual fight, that kind of ends it. Maybe you do have an actual fight, but that ends it. If you have a temper tantrum, that doesn't solve any problem. You know, parents maybe pay attention to temper tantrums, but they never get you anywhere with playmates. 
So what do you, so you have to somehow learn how to deal with that anger. You have to learn how to assert yourself about it. And you have to, if you're the cause of the anger, you have to learn how to apologize about it. So, and, and there's actually research done with animals suggesting that the analog of asserting yourself that, you know, hey, wait a minute, you violated that rule. You nipped me a little too hard there. That was not a play nip, that was a real nip. Uh, and there's a way that the other animal, if these are dogs or wolves in the, in the canid family, there's an actual play bow, which is the apology. I didn't mean it. <laughs> and then when they both bow, then they go back to playing. They've overcome their anger. So overcoming, so, so learning how to deal with fear, overcoming anger, these are really important lessons of play learned by all uh, young animals. So I want to, I've, I think there's still a few minutes left, I want to say something about the value of age mixed play. This is actually, much of my own research focus has been on the value of age mixed play. Um, you know, second to the, to the fact that we um, have made learning work rather than play, the second worst thing we've done to children is to segregate them by age. Uh, throughout human history, children were never segregated by age. And in hunter-gatherer bands, because the bands were small, even if, even if somebody wanted to segregate by age, they couldn't. There wouldn't be enough kids of the same age. So play, our instincts to play evolved in a world in which play was always age mixed. Age segregated play is an abnormal kind of play that we have imposed upon children by segregating them from children of other ages. I've had the opportunity to study children in an age mixed environment where there are children from age four on through uh, teenage years uh, who are freely mixing with one another. And there's lots of children and they're free to play and explore pretty much all day long. Those who've seen my book know the context in which I've done this study at the Sudbury Valley School but I won't go into details about that now, but the point I want to make is that that's the kind of play that existed in hunter-gatherer cultures, that's the kind of play that existed in basically all cultures, and it's the kind of play that existed in neighborhoods, even in our culture, when I was a kid. But we don't have that anymore. Now even outside of school, we segregate children by age. We put them into clubs and activities and so forth based on age. And when we do that, we are depriving them of those people from whom they have the most to learn. People who are a little older than themselves and people who are a little younger than themselves. What I want to do uh, some briefly, because there's not time to elaborate, is, talk, is say something about what are the benefits of age mixing for the younger child in the group and for the older child in the group. The first benefit, the most obvious benefit for the younger child is that younger children, when playing with older children, can play at more sophisticated things than they could possibly play at if they were just playing with age mates. That applies in every realm of play. So just to take a simple example, two four-year-olds. Let's say you had a school of just four-year-olds you would never have a simple game of catch <laughs> because two four-year-olds can't play catch with one another. Neither one of them can throw the ball straight enough for the other one to catch it, nor can they run and leap and catch the wild throw of the other four-year-old. So they might start playing catch, but it just falls apart because they can't do it. But put an eight-year-old in the mix. The eight-year-old can toss the ball gently into the hands of the four-year-old and enjoy his skill and feel the pleasure of that four-year-old catching it, and that eight-year-old can run and leap and jump and stretch his own sketching skills by catching the wild throw of the four-year-old. This kind of scaffolding of play, where the older child is adjusting his or her behavior in such a way to enable the younger one to do it, occurs all the time, and it occurs at no sacrifice to the enjoyment or skill development of the older child. They work out intrinsically. They don't necessarily even discuss it. It just happens naturally. They work out ways of playing that all, everybody's stretching their skills, but they're playing in a way that they're complementing one another's behaviors. I've seen children learn to read. Many children learn to read because they're interacting with older children who know how to read. So that's part of it, the scaffolding that occurs whenever, in fact, I had a graduate student who did his doctoral thesis on age mixed play where he was observing children 
who were at least four years apart and who spanned um, puberty so that the older child was always 13 or older and the younger child was always at least four years younger, in some cases considerably younger than that, uh, and had not yet reached puberty. So these were obvious differences in age and in appearance and ability and so on and so forth. And there was a lot of such mixed play. Little kids, it turns out, love teenagers, and teenagers love little kids. No surprise. I mean, teenagers are, historically, they're going to become parents before too long. And so natural selection would create a drive to want to know something about little kids so that you're not practicing on your own kid to, at the beginning. So, the, uh, so it's no surprise, boys as well as girls just love little kids. They like to, they have them on their lap, they read to them, they give them piggyback rides, they're interacting with them all the time. And the little kids, of course, adore the older kids. So that, so that age mixing leads, I mean, what he observed is in every case, essentially every case of interaction between children who were that different in age was a learning experience for the younger child. The younger child in every case was doing something at a more complex and higher level than the child would have been able to do by himself or just with, with age mates. Even when they're not playing together, the younger children are learning from the, by observing the older children. I once spent some time in this school where I was just sitting out on the playground watching, and just as an illustration of this, so there were, there were a couple of girls who may be 11 and 12 years old. There's a big tall slide, one of those big old-fashioned tall slides there. And they were walking down the slide. And uh, this was, took a certain amount of skill for them, but they could do it pretty easily. And there was a six-year-old girl watching them. And she saw them walking down the slide, and she climbed up the slide. And she, just clearly, she was imitating them, walking down that slide you know, with her hands down like this and really stretching her skills. The, what was also interesting is the 11-year-old said, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, they were trying to talk her out of it. But she insisted on doing it, and they stood there, not too obviously, but they stood there, and it was very clear to me they were standing there to catch her if she did fall. Then those 11-year-old girls went off and began climbing trees, and then a little later I saw this six-year-old girl climbing trees. So this was a very obvious example of it. But children who are younger, they look at children who are a little bit older than themselves for models of what Maybe I can do that. These amazing older children are doing this. Can I do that? And the same thing occurs with reading in this setting. The older children, are, they're reading comic books, or they're talking about the Harry Potter books that they're reading, or whatever it is they're doing. And younger children hear that, and they see that, and they see that this is part of real life and fun. This isn't just something you're abstract that you're doing in the classroom just for the sake of learning to read. This is something fun. And they want to join that club. They want to learn to read. So the motivation to do new things comes from observing older children, children do them. So that, those are advantages to the younger children. The advantages to the older children are the sort of the flip side of that. The older children are learning how to be caring and nurturant. They're learning a sense of their own maturity. You know, even a six-year-old in relationship to a four-year-old or a three-year-old is the mature one, the one who's looking out for the younger one, the one who's teaching and helping. How important it is growing up not to feel like you are always the one who needs help, but you are the one who can actually give help. And when you've got, you're in an age-mixed environment, you can always, there are always people who, are look, who you can give help to, that you can teach, that you can show them something. You gain a sense of yourself as a nurturing person. There's a lot of research showing that, I shouldn't say there's a lot of research, there's a little bit of, little bit of research. I wish there were a lot of research. There just isn't a lot of research on this topic. But there's research showing that children are nicer in an age-mixed environment than they are in an age-segregated environment. The older kids especially are. They are nicer not just to the little kids, but they're nicer to one another. There's less bullying that goes on. And part of the reason they are nicer is they recognize that they're setting a model for the younger kids. There's something in our DNA that, that's, that brings out the nurturing instinct that's in all of us when there are little kids around. Um, there's a, some of you might know about the um, Roots of Empathy program that started off in Canada that 
they discovered that just bringing a baby into the classroom periodically, a new baby, initially they brought the baby in to sort of teach the children about what it means to be a mother, to try to encourage them not to become mothers until <laughs> later on because it's a big job. But what they discovered was that by bringing a baby into the classroom, a side effect, the teacher said, the, ki the, the kids are all nicer to one another. <laughs> not, not just when the baby is here, but even when the baby isn't here. Uh, people who would bully are not bullying as much as they did before. There's something just, oh, when we, when we segregate children by age, we are producing the conditions that produce competitiveness and cliquishness and bullying. When we have children of very mixed ages, play becomes much more cooperative and nurturing. It's equally and maybe even more uh, uh, valuable in terms of the skills you're learning because you can practice these wide variety of skills but it's not competitive in the same sense. So another advantage to the uh, older children comes from the fact that they are always teaching. They're in some ways explain, you know, whenever you're playing new, some new game with the younger kids, you have to explain to them how to do it. And teaching leads you to understand something more deeply than you did before. You have to sort of think it through in order to explain it to the other person. So in an age-mixed environment, Everybody is in some sense a teacher to the younger kids, not because they're deliberately trying to improve the younger kids, but rather because just to play this game, you have to teach them. You're playing a game that there are words on the screen and you can read and this other kid can't read. You're pointing out the words. <laughs> and I've even seen kids pointing out, you know, there's a code here. There's, a, you know, the, the, there's sounds to these letters. <laughs> It, essentially teaching them to read, they're not even thinking of themselves as teaching them to read, they're just thinking of themselves as playing this game and helping, in order to make the game go, they have to show them the words. Or they're showing them numbers, or they're teaching how to add so they can add up scores in whatever game they're playing. This happens all the time. And uh, another characteristic is just as the younger children are inspired by watching the older children to do more difficult and sophisticated things, the older children are inspired by watching the younger children to do more creative things. Younger children are generally more creative than older children. And one of the reasons older children lose their creativity is that as they grow older in an age-segregated environment, it does, it's no longer cool to color with crayons or play with Legos or make structures with clay or to play fantasy games. But if there's a bunch of little kids around doing all that stuff, you're kind of stimulated to do it too. Maybe the excuse is you're doing it with them, but you're also doing it. And sometimes you're just doing it parallel with them. So that creative, those creative behaviors stay longer with you with teenagers in an age mixed environment. And then finally, for those teenagers, you know, we think of certain kinds of teenagers who become kind of cynical and burned out and depressed and so on. And at this particular school where I've done this research, there's a certain number of kids who come as teenagers and they are burned out, they're depressed. But you know, it's pretty hard to remain that way when there's a bunch of little kids who want you to give them a piggyback ride. So the little kids really raise the spirits of the bigger kids. And for those older kids who have social difficulties, who don't know how very well to get along with kids their own age, the little kids really are glad to play with them. And they, those kids learn social skills by interacting with the little kids. So those are, um, the, the, I, should, um, I should bring it to a close at this point, but I want to, since the, um, the title of this uh, talk that um, Walter gave me is The Promise of Play. And as you know, the theme of this is, the, is fulfilling the promise of play. So I figured I probably ought to say something about the promise of play. So what, um, what um, if I, so I began to think about what is the promise of play that I would like to see fulfilled? And this is probably the promise that many of you would have, but also many of you are thinking about play in very different ways. And I'm sure there are a lot of different ways of thinking about the theme of this conference. But to me, it would be this. It would be a promise, this promise of play is a promise to children. And the promise of ch to children that I wish we could make, we can't make it, but I wish we could make it, and I wish we could fulfill it is that we are going to remove all the barriers that we have set up to play. We are going to allow you to play. 
we are going to give you the time, the space, the playmates, the, op the access to playmates, the trust, the freedom that play requires. These are the things that are children's natural right. These are the things that children always had in the past, except in pathological environments. The promise I wish we could make and fulfill for children is that we will allow you to play the way you are designed to play. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>